Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. All right. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me from, what, 30-something exits away on the LAE? I'm not sure. It's John. Just about, though. I guess it's like 30, probably even more than 35. Ah, Jesus. Well, we are the wardens of Long Island. We got both sides covered. I guess we got Pat in the middle, but he hasn't been contributing too much these days. I drove past his house today, actually. Actually, the past two days I drove past his house. Oh, really? I think today actually might have been home. I probably should have stopped it, but I was in the left lane. I couldn't really stop. And I, and I, and I like doing that, coming by, like, unannounced. Yeah, like, yeah. It's like, here I am. It's like, hey. It's like, hey. Yeah. All right. Gotta go. So, John, how's the summer going? It's all right, I guess. Vacation. Going by quick already. Yeah, mercifully, we're in the month of August. And as I get older, I just, the summer is just too much for me. The heat, I can't deal with the air conditioning. I used to love summer when I was a kid, as an adult, especially, you know, with the eight-year-old in the house. Dude, I love September. Like, when he starts getting on the bus every morning, that's that's the best. I love the kid, but that is the best. Get in the goddamn bus! Yeah, you got it. When you hear that bus pull up, it's like, all right, cool. That's uh, it, up, up. Yeah. <laughs> You're up. You're out. Get to school, bro. Do that math. A couple things to look forward to in August, I think. Jim Halpert has his new TV show on Amazon. Nah, I really don't have Amazon, so I don't even know. Oh, dude, yeah. Yeah, whatever John Krasinski is playing. Shit, why can I not think of it? Harrison Ford played him in two movies. And uh, Ben Affleck most recently played him. Oh, um, Jack uh, Jack, Jack Ryan. Jack Ryan, yeah. I was, I was thinking Jack Bauer, but it, was, it wasn't fucking Jack Bauer. There was a Jack involved. Yeah, Jack involved. The Jack Ryan TV show, which actually looks real good. It already got picked up for a second season, so they're confident in this TV show. I'm excited about that. Better Call Saul Season 4 and SummerSlam, which you're not that excited about, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, I was watching Raw the other night. Mm-hmm. Actually, I watched it last Monday night also, the last match. At this point, I guess Roman Reigns is going to win. Yeah, but I thought <sighs> the same thing going into WrestleMania. I mean, it just looks like, what are you going to do with Brock Lesnar now that what he did with you know with Heyman? It just seems like this is his way out. He's He hurt Heyman. He, you know, he suplexes, angle. I just don't see it. Obviously, we're not a wrestling podcast, but John and I, going back to ninth grade, tenth grade, one of the first things that we became friends over was our love for professional wrestling. And this was this was even before the Attitude Era. This was the very beginnings of the Attitude Era back then. Stone Cold mm-hmm. Steve Austin, The Rock, and all that. It's probably before the NWO also, actually. Yeah, it was. Right at the cusp. I don't think you had a spoiler that Hogan was the third man, did you? No, no one really knew. No one really... We were talking about, there was rumors that it was Owen Hart, that it was Bret Hart, or Shawn Michaels. Sting was the backup plan. I know that. Sting was the backup right. plan. If Hogan was going to do it that day, then they would have made some sort of thing that Sting was going to turn. You're right. Yeah. See, originally, he approached Hogan, and Hogan was told no by his wife. She's like, don't do it, it'll ruin your career or whatever. So Hogan's like, can't do it, brother. So then he approached Sting, and Sting's like, yeah, whatever. You know, I guess Sting is just like, been like that his whole career, just like, all right, yeah, whatever. Like, Sting, you're going to tag team with Robocop. All right, yeah, whatever. Tag team with Robocop. But then Hogan, I guess, saw how well Hall and Nash were doing on TV and how much buzz they were getting. As Kevin Nash once put it, that money train wasn't taken off without Hogan on board. (laughs) He changed his mind and he decided to be the third man and uh, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Point being... Yeah, we don't talk about wrestling too much, and wrestling nowadays, I can't watch the weekly shit, because it's just, there's too much, it's too, too many much. hours, too much, but poor a, but writing. A perfect segue into the joke I wanted to say today, actually involved, well, someone that involves the Bash of the Beach incident. After the incident, and Hogan's talking with me and Gene. The NWO reveal, the Hogan turn. Yeah, as Bash of okay. the Beach. I remember Hogan saying something to the lines of, 
when he came to WCW, which was around 1994. He came around 94, 1994 he came in. Right, with the big parade. <laughs> <laughs> with the big, huge parade. And, uh, yeah, he, you know, he's, he's saying how, you know, billionaire Ted promised him world championship caliber matches. Billionaire Ted promised him all this. And he's like, well, frankly, on board. What I wanted to bring up today was a, a funny joke that was on a podcast with Conrad Thompson and Tony Giovanni. What happened when... I actually don't even know you know who Conrad Thompson is. What What is his... Was he an, insi- an insider all these years? Not at all. He was a fan, just like you and I. I think he's our age. Yeah, he definitely looks like he's our age, yeah. He's in his mid-30s. Yeah, he late 20s, just like us. Yeah. I think he's a real estate guy. Mm-hmm. And somehow he got it hooked into hosting a podcast with Ric Flair. I think that was his first major podcast. Like he did other wrestling podcasts on his own or whatever and worked his way up to hosting one with Ric Flair, which didn't last very long because mm-hmm. of because of Ric Flair. And then he parlayed that into I think he did the Shivani podcast next. No, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Pritchard pr- first. Yeah, that's possible also. Because the Shivani's are in two thousand eighteen, Pritchard's are in two thousand seventeen. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I guess Pritchard had had a podcast also where he just commented on the current product, and somehow the two of them got together. They met through a mutual acquaintance. They 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 were both involved with uh, MLW Radio, which is Major League Wrestling. It does all these different wrestling podcasts, mm-hmm. and it actually does promotions now too, live events. He somehow got hooked in with Bruce Bruce Pritchard, who was brother love. And at one point, he was the the head writer for WWE, talent development and uh, talent relations. But he got hooked in with Bruce Pritchard and met him. And Bruce Pritchard, I guess the story goes, went by Conrad Thompson's house and they watched a pay-per-view together and they got to talking about something. And Conrad Thompson says, this should be the podcast, not about the current product, but we go back and we get your take on events throughout WWE history that really happened. And the podcast... It took off pretty quick. I think they started with like the steroid scandal and then they did one about um, like the Warriors run in the WWE, uh, a Ravishing Rick Rude podcast, and they would just focus on a particular wrestler or a particular event. And now they do a mix of wrestlers' runs in the WWE. For example, Hogan, uh, they'll do a Hulk Hulk Hogan 87 to 88 podcast. And then they'll follow it up with like, WWE Invasion 2003, where they talk about the business at that point in time leading up to the pay-per-view, the feuds, why the matches were made. And it's really cool to get the the background info on, you know, the, besi- the behind-the-scenes info on these pay-per-views. And it's really breaking breaking down kayfabe and, and going at it from a business perspective, which is interesting for, you know, guys like you and me who obviously we know that wrestling is fake in terms of the outcomes. But it's interesting what goes on behind the scenes. What was, you know, Conrad loves to use the word, uh, were there any, uh, what's he use, any gossip and, you know, what's he say, grandeur oh, uh, or. Uh, rumors uh, and innuendo. Rumors and innuendos. He always uses, he always uses that. If I may play the conspiracy role, uh, if I say this, was this true? And. And that's because he's looking at it from the point of view of you and I. Of a fan. And, you know. Yeah, and we how heard, we hear and how we used to hear things. He'd be like, "Oh my god, that you know, she would really happen." Yeah, like Savage will will never get into the WWE Hall of Fame because he was <laughs> banging, banging Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah, so he'll ask Bruce Pritchard about that. Rumors and innuendo said that Savage had relations with Stephanie when she was fifteen, and Pritchard would be like, well, "Like that's so crazy." She was only sixteen when it happened. <laughs> fifteen, come on, she was sixteen. So anyway, from Bruce Pritchard, he started hosting one with Tony Schiavone. And I'm going to say this right now, and I know we Sean talk about theory. He's not a huge Schiavone fan. I used to love Tony Schiavone. Really? I loved him. I, I, I was a big Schiavone fan. I really was. Okay. No I love this vote. He's a good play-by-play. I would have no gladly doubt. would have taken him to WWE and not have Michael Cole. I can't stand oh. Michael Cole. That's one of the reasons why I came and watched the WWE, because I just can't stand Michael Cole. He had, to me, has no life to him. To like when he sees a huge moment and he tries to bring that life into it, it just doesn't work at all. No. He's a Vince Stooge. He's a uh, John Cena Stooge. I think John Cena is, is uh, a... Yeah. yeah, I heard he's a... Uh, John Cena is a good friend. Well, I guess in the back, you know, so that's why my call is just there. Yeah. Listen, Jim Ross is great. Jim Ross is, you know, better than Shivani. I'm not, you know, I would not take Shivani over Jim Ross, but I would have loved to have Shivani come over there and be as like their number two guy. 
yeah. over Michael Cole. But I think the problem was, and I don't, I don't know if they talk about this on the Shivani podcast. He brought it up a couple times on his end that you know he was kind of professional rivalry. Like they didn't so much get along, or, or they they couldn't really work together, Shivani and Ross. Right. Which is a shame because you know what, Shivani is still a young man, and had he been able to get along with Ross, it would be so much better if he was the voice of the WWE now than Michael Cole. Because you know, Michael Cole is just a suit. It's not really Michael Cole talking; it's Vince McMahon talking in his ear. He's just saying what he's scripted to say. And Shivani said that was kind of what happened in WCW also. He was kind of, on some of the, he didn't say it was just scripted, you know. Yeah. But, um, get on with the, with the funniest thing of all time. Well, that, that the funniest of all thing of all time, but that was the funniest thing I've heard probably in months. And I'll give you a little backdrop. I mentioned before with the Hogan and the whole entire World Caliber matches, they were talking about what happened when 1995 Halloween Havoc. And they would talk about the whole entire pay-per-view. This was the Howling Havoc where Hogan faced the giant, and they had the... Uh, is this with the big structure, the three levels of... Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, this okay. is uh, where they had the monster trucks on top of the oh. arena. <laughs> this was really bad. Shivani, <laughs> Shivani, all this podcast, give him credit. He's just bashing it. He's bashing it. He's just, you know, he's just going like, oh, just wait, just wait till the end where we just, you know... Really just suck the life out of wrestling and how bad this is going to be. Quick sidebar, like, one of the Shivani's biggest complaints were the undercard. They had so many wrestlers on the undercard that were good wrestlers. Dude, they, they all went on to have super successful careers in the WWE. Yeah. They had the talent, but instead of that, they're playing in the wrestling, in the, in the pay-per-view itself, they're playing uh, John Tenta for his big Bubba Rogers in like oh, uh, God. Yeah. some sort of like, I forgot how match it was, but it's just like, that's, that's your pay-per-view. But in the undercard, you had, you know, a Dean Malenko for a Ray Mysterio or something like that. I'm just, you know, yeah. hypothetical, you know, who, were, who was ever wrestling. You, right. you know, William Regal against someone. William Regal, yeah, not a flashy guy, but he's a good worker. Could, you know, oh, be dude, a, amazing worker. Great, yeah. great villain. I fuck, I loved William Regal. Any version of him. Yeah, you looked at him like this guy, it's like from like a wrestling standpoint, it's like, how's he going to wrestle? But like, he knew he worked because he knew how to sell everything. Mm-hmm. Those are always the guys that like in t- in today's wrestling, those are the guys that really never, not that they don't get over, but they don't have the championship runs and the success. Like a guy mm-hmm. like Dolph Ziggler, as popular as he is with the crowd, as good as a wrestler as he is. He's best used making your John Cena's look good. John Cena versus Batista, two high-profile stars, they're not going to put on that great of a match. But John Cena versus Dolph Ziggler, that'll be a good match because Dolph Ziggler will work so hard, but he won't get the credit. It'll go to John Mm -hmm. Cena. That's exactly who William Regal was. He wasn't going to find the championship success, but he was going to be able to put over the Hogan, put over fucking Big Show or or the Giant or or whoever they needed to put uh, over. What you really should uh, go and look, Sean, is look into the whole entire William Regal Goldberg incident. And, oh wow! Yeah, I never heard of that. Yeah, look into it on YouTube. It's pretty good. You get you know kind of both sides of the story. And it was in WCW. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Basically, Regal didn't like like Goldberg because he think Goldberg wasn't ready for the push. He wasn't a good wrestler. He wasn't a good worker. He definitely wasn't. <laughs> and yeah, no, he wasn't. I guess in one of their matches, I guess he was really. You gotta look on YouTube. It's they they explain a lot better. But I guess Regal's kind of embarrassing him a little bit with some of the moves. And Goldberg got pissed. I guess so, yeah. Tried to kick him in the head and end his career. <laughs> he took it on Bret Hart. Oh, he probably fucking hated where Bret Hart probably fucking hated where oh, he yeah. and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. So he's in this paper on Halloween Havoc 95. This is when, like, this is just the time where it's a year after they got Hogan. It's like the epitome of Hogan cheese ball. Right. They got Nitro. They got Lex Luger over. But, like, the matches just were not... Yeah, they just weren't good matches, and they, you know, they were trying to sell the giant as Andre the Giant's son, which was really stupid. Yeah, the Dungeon of Doom had like they had oh Megan there, AK Haku, who's yeah. who's great, a great wrestler. Yeah, but for the most part, it was all a bunch of scrubs. I felt like it was like nineteen eighties WWF, where they, the type of wrestlers they had in that, you know, in that group. Yeah, was just so bad. So just just trying to you know an overview of where we are in ninety five. And just think how bad this match was. Before the event, they had them taped already, and they had Hogan and the Giant on top of, I'm not sure if it was the Joe Louis Arena, but it was in Detroit. And it was by, way high up, yeah. Yeah, it was near like Lake Michigan or one of the lakes in Michigan. Now, 
I don't know what the whole entire angle would have been. Like, how would you, you know? <laughs> like, how do you win a, a, a monster <laughs> truck Exactly, match? exactly. I'm going to skip over the Conrad Thompson great line just to say what one thing that Shivani hated about this was not already how bad it is, but it ends with Johnny being tossed over in his car, wherever it was, into Lake Michigan. So Hogan's truck pushes his truck off. Right. Right. So now they're ready for the main event. <laughs> <laughs> and this when Jimmy Hart turns evil. Now this when Jimmy Hart turns bad on Hogan, he turns heel. But now, like they're all thinking, like Hogan killed someone. Like, oh my god, the giant's dead. But then the giant comes out. Okay, the giant. Now mind, he was in Lake Michigan. Right. Like this is WCW for you. If you're gonna do something stupid like this, at least try to make it kind of real. Like follow through with it at least. He's completely dry. <laughs> he has no signs of wetness at all. And there's no signs of a bruise or an injury or a <laughs> limp or anything that would result from being in a in a monster truck and falling into a lake. <laughs> from the like, top of the Joe Louis Arena. <laughs> he just <laughs> right. He just comes out like completely like, you know, as if he was coming out for a little match, like nothing ever happened. <laughs> and Shivani's just killing the match. Because now this is also the match at the end when the Yeti comes out. Oh my god. That oh, the Yeti. Oh, the Yeti. Oh, <laughs> Here my comes god. the Yeti, and we're going to screw you, fans, because this is talky shit. <laughs> He'll do new play by play for the matches or something. And yeah, yeah. Like this guy. <laughs> Look at this horse shit coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. The Yeti. Oh, so bad. Now, here's another, before I go on, again, before I get the Conrad Thompson line, the Yeti was supposed to be the giant Gonzalez. Okay. And it wasn't Johnny Gonzalez. A lot of people thought it was, but it's this guy called Ron Reese. Ron Reese. And he never did anything after that because he's a big dude. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, shitty wrestler, but. Yeah. I'm sure he was, was involved in that 60 man battle royal like, a couple years later. <laughs> oh, yeah. What are the World War Three uh, matches? <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Yeti. Oh, God. It was so bad. But that's where like, WCW was the point, which is really kind of a perfect thing for Hogan. And, you know, I was promised all these great matches, but like, look, look what I was doing, you know, like yeah. the Yeti. So anyways, the great Conrad Thompson line, and this was just so great. If you didn't catch it, you wouldn't even get it. You know, you had to catch what he said. And while they were talking about how they were up on the uh, the roof and how Hogan was just about to push the giant over, right? Conrad Thompson goes, how come every time Hulk Hogan commits a crime, he's always on video? <laughs> <laughs> I was dying (laughs) because I'm thinking about myself. He had the whole entire, you know, the N word that he used on video. He had the whole entire thing with his son on video. He's cheating on his wife on video. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Everything happens to him on video. (laughs) Every time he commits a crime, he's on video. Uh, uh, John, I don't know how you feel about. I mean, I'm I'm glad that Hogan's back in the WWE fold and Hall of Fame, but not all the WWE talent is very happy about this. Specifically, the I don't know what the word I want to use is, but the black talent of the WWE, your New Day, and although I will give credit to the New Day, they're basically what they said was Hogan is a great wrestler. Without what he's done, we wouldn't be where we are today. That being said, we don't agree with what he said. But we're going to do our best to separate the man from former. If it's me, may use the same word one time on TV, too. So did uh, Booker T, right? So did Booker T. Okay. See, Hogan, we're going to get you. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of took a little bit, a little bit of my sauce out of what I was going to reply to you with. Oh, my bad. It's all right. When Hogan had his Bash of the Beach speech, it might have been the most truest speech in wrestling history. Because if it wasn't for Hulk Hogan, all these Johnny Come Latelys wouldn't be out here right now. And it's true. It is true. Listen, there was a period in my life where I did not like Hogan at all. And it was during the Monday Night Wars when it was obvious to me that WCW didn't really know what they were doing. They were just throwing everything against the wall. And they were only winning the ratings because of the NWO and because of Hogan. At that point in time, I was not a Hogan fan. And even when he came back to the WWE, finally, at first it was great, but then like his victory over Shawn Michaels, like stuff like that part of his career, that that wasn't really necessary. 
And I thought, how is he still Hulk Hogan of old at such an old age? But now that his in-ring career is, is over, look at what he's done. You go back and you watch WrestleMania 3, WrestleMania 5, even WrestleMania 7, the matches that he's in. Like, it's like a rock star. And like, what was the allure of this guy? I never thought he was a great worker until I saw a match he had with the great Muda in New Japan where he fucking worked his ass off. And he, and he put on a, a good match that you never saw him put on in the WWE. And the WWE, not that he took it easy and mailed it in, but he wasn't going to injure himself. You know, he wasn't going to get injured in the ring. Watch um, WrestleMania 6 again. He carries that match to the Warrior. That's how bad the oh, match sure. the Warrior is. Warrior is a horrible in-ring wrestler. You want to yeah. complain, if people want to complain Hogan, Warrior is horrible. The best matches Warrior had was, I mean, Hogan, Macho Man was able to get a good match out of him, but Macho right. Man, he's one of those guys that could wrestle a broomstick. Right. And then Rude, Rick Rude, also got good matches out of the Warrior. But they were doing the majority of the work. The Warrior was just the Warrior. Posing and the Warrior was a sloppy wrestler. Andre Hay working with the Warrior. Mm -hmm. If you listen to that, you know, on that initial WWF DVD on the Warrior, the self destruction of the Warrior, you know, Bobby Heenan said, you know, classic. You know, I love Heenan, love Heenan, hated him. Heenan yeah. hated him. My God. Yeah. But he was just telling how every house show they would, when they had Russell, the Warrior kept on, I guess, like going pretty hard and heavy on the Giant. And then the Giant warned them, What are you doing? So the next night, when the Warrior was going to do it again, Bobby's like, Andre let his hand out and boom. Knocked him out? Knocked him down. Good. Returns into a wrestling podcast. You know, I'm yeah, always, well, right. okay. always going to be a Hogan apologist. If it, you know, Hogan is my idol in wrestling. I will always favor Hulk Hogan. Listen, Hogan, some of the stuff, if you this Ryan ass kid outside the ring, say what you want. But then, like, the Warriors out there every few two minutes, you know, with this podcast, you know, ripping on them. I said, Warrior, yeah. you. You pretty much were given the keys to the WWF and you spat at every wrestler's face and left. Don't be lecturing us on how bad Hulk Hogan is. They kind of retconned the Warriors' history. He maybe was the man at one point in time, but it wasn't for very long and it didn't work out well at all. Hogan tried to pass the torch a few times. It always came back to him. Some people say it was politics he played in the back, but you get to a certain point with that character – that's your livelihood. That's how you put food on the table for your family. It's your future. It, it's everything's wrapped up in, in that wrestling persona. So if you were the best in the world and the most popular in the world, why would you want to make a decision to hurt that standing? You, when you said Bash at the Beach incident before with Hogan, obviously the big one is his turn and joining the NWO, but there was the Bash at the Beach incident. I guess it was the, the final WCW Bash at the Beach. Oh, yeah, with, uh, with Jarrett. Right. He had in his claws that he did not want to lose the belt to uh, Jeff Jarrett. Well, he had creative control. Right. Which I guess Bischoff gave to like everybody. He gave everybody creative control. But he said, I don't think the fans will buy that. I think he is actually kind of right. Yeah. Who, nobody gives a shit about Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett is not anywhere near as great a wrestler as some people think that he is. And to have Hogan at that point in time lose to Jeff Jarrett, it, it doesn't make sense. And it does harm Hogan. And that was the final appearance of Hogan in WCW, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that was it, because after that, he sued, uh, he sued uh, Russo. Yeah. Russo's a fucking idiot, dude. Yeah. Ugh. Interesting time in wrestling. And yeah, you look at it now, where a few years ago, there was no competition for the WWE. There's not really competition now, but Japan wrestling is much bigger worldwide than it was. Ring of Honor's still around, I think at this point, bigger than TNA. And then you have everything that Cody Rhodes is doing on the independent scene and in New Japan Pro Wrestling. There are other household names that aren't in the WWE, which is, it's nowhere near the Monday Night Wars, but it's also far and away where wrestling was in like 2008, 2009, where it was just the WWE and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the WWE in some ways is a lot better with NXT. If you like wrestling, you have to watch an NXT event. Every single match is awesome. When they move up to the main roster, some of them get lost in the shuffle, and it's the same old shit a lot of times, as we see with Roman Reigns. It's not the Attitude Era, but it's possibly the best era since the Attitude Era. It's better than the Ruthless Aggression Era and the whole John Cena run. I mean, if Roman Reigns is their guy, just fucking pull the trigger already and do it. Essentially, all they've done with this whole Roman Reigns-Brock Lesnar build, which I guess they've tried to mirror... What happened with Daniel Bryan a few years ago where he was the underdog and, and finally won the title. 
They're trying every way they can think of to make Roman Reigns popular with the crowd. They'll drag The Rock out to lift his hand and he still gets booed. (laughs) There's rumors that The Rock's going to be at WrestleMania. I think if he shows up at WrestleMania, he's not going to get the huge pop that he always gets. Mm -hmm. Because he's going to come out there in support of Roman Reigns. He may get booed. He he was nearly booed at the Royal Rumble. But all they've done with this whole build is make Brock Lesnar basically the best wrestler in history of the WWE by ending Undertaker's streak, by winning the title and holding it for over a year, and then losing it, beating Goldberg, winning it back, holding it for over a year. The guy is unstoppable, and it's just to build him up when Roman Reigns finally beats him, but they don't pull the trigger on it. It's two WrestleManias that he hasn't beaten him, and now it's going to be SummerSlam again. And Like, why would this be the moment that, that Roman Reigns finally beats him? It doesn't make sense to me, but there's other good stuff going on in wrestling. Anyway, that's a fucking funny story about Conrad yeah. Thompson. He's a good podcast host. Those are good podcasts yeah. he does. What's it called with Shivani? The Shivani podcast? What happened when? Yeah, what happened when? Right. And then he's got something to wrestle with Bruce mm-hmm. Pritchard. And 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff is his new one. Which is also, I mean, along the same lines as the Shivani podcast. Which I don't think he does anymore. I think, I think that podcast has stopped recording. But obviously, you can still get the episodes. I don't know how the hell to parlay all of that into... Game of Thrones news, except the matchup John and I had on last episode where we had a little bit of a disagreement about the final episodes of Game of Thrones. Just let, just let this be a warning to you. It's like you choosing Stannis, me choosing the Rifle King. I'm right. Listen, you're right and I was wrong. It just would, it would have been too it would have been too long. It would have been two years. It, it would have been too long. First off, John's been saying since day one, since we knew that we'd have no Game of Thrones in 2018, John's been saying April, May, maybe March, most likely April. John's been saying that. I said that for a little while too. And I think that I changed my tune when I learned that Game of Thrones would not be at San Diego Comic Con this year for the first year ever in the show's history. And it got me thinking about all the hype that HBO wants to put into these six final episodes, surely they're going to do a big victory tour, and surely it's going to include San Diego Comic-Con, which is the worldwide showcase for geek culture, whatever you want to call it, which is just over the top. Everybody's geek now. Grammar school, high school, we'd get made fun of for liking Star Wars or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever, but now it's like everybody likes that. Like Everybody's a nerd. Everybody's a geek. And San Diego Comic-Con is really the pinnacle of that culture. So I thought there's no way they'll do a victory tour. There's no way they won't do a Comic-Con for the final season. But as it turns out, they won't. I was wrong. John was right. Because the news is not exactly April, we said, right? It's not It's not definitively April. Well, but it's not definitely April, but first half of 2019. They're not going to do the summer again. They're not going to do June. It would make the most sense for April going into May. That's when it's always aired, except for season seven. It's always done well there. And while people are still in school, you know, before the summer starts, it's a Sunday evening. That's prime television watching. I'm going to say it's going to be April 14th. Okay. Second Sunday in April, six episodes. We're going to May 19th, a week before Memorial Day. Okay. That's what I would think. Or it could be April 7th. I agree with that. You don't think March. It could be March. It could be like, you know, March 29th or that, where that Sunday is. The only thing with March is there's other television competition. We live in this world of, they call it prestige television. Sunday night's always the night where the best shows are on. And if you're bringing Game of Thrones back in March, you're going to have competition from all the prestige television that's been on since January or February. I think April 14th sounds about right. Six episodes. So the last one would air. The week, you said the week before Memorial Day? Mm-hmm. All right. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. I'm writing that down, John. 4 14, 19. Game of Thrones, the final episodes. So, along with that news, we also have a bit of a rebuttal from the prequel news that we had, which was all the prequels being developed are greenlit and going to be put into production. The first one was going to be put into production in October of this year. But that's not true. In actuality, the Jane Goldman prequel, which is the one based on The Long Night and The Age of Heroes, that one's going to be in production as the final episodes are airing. So it's possible that we see it 
at the end of 2019. Though I would think it's more likely we get a late January, early February run for the first prequel series in 2020. Give Westeros a little bit of a breather before we go right back to it. And I'm still not excited about it. I'm interested, but I'm not excited. One thing I was wrong with, actually there's been two things, I'm going to segue this into something else I'm going to talk about. I always, I, I thought when they first you know, announced that there would be prequels, it was really happening off the off the last season. And I mm-hmm. really thought that Aegon and his conquest would be a perfect... Yes, I thought so too. You'd have everything there. You'd have the two female leads, you'd have the dragons, you have Aegon the first, the name Aegon would be fresh on people's minds. Houses that the audience is already familiar with, for mm-hmm. the most part. What's wrong about that? And I'm going to tell you something else I was wrong about. I just read a interview yesterday. I'm not sure when it was done, whether it's recent or how recent it was, with uh, Sean Bean. And in the interview, Sean Bean said that he played the part of Eddard Stark to Jon Snow as if he was his father. That he was not told about Jon's true lineage. And I was wrong about that. I always thought the way that Sean Bean acted in that season, they told him off air. They had to have told him something, though. Like, acted this way. You know what I'm saying? Like, they had to have. He's not a, exactly a master actor. A master actor would do a scene, a whole array of playing different ways, so the director has a choice of how they want to edit it, which take they want to use. A master actor is able to do all these different versions of one scene. I don't know that Sean Bean's a master actor. But he's a really good actor. The way he plays it, you do think he knows the truth. I'm surprised at that. Yeah, I t- t- I was wrong. Well, the, the only thing I could think of is maybe he played it with the mystery of who his mother was and not wanting to tell him who his mother was. Maybe he played it as though he thought that was something that would be revealed, which it, which it is revealed later on, just with him not being the father. Played it thinking that who his mother was, that reveal would be huge. To both characters, which again, it is, but not the way that he thought it would be. I would never have thought that he didn't know that. It's actually kind of odd that they would allow Ned Stark, the actor playing Ned Stark, to go into that blind. That's weird to me. They had to give him certain cues of how to act in certain situations, I guess. But yeah. Just not to a point where he actually knew. You know what? Now I want to look at, at who directed those episodes. I mean, it's only a handful of scenes between Ned and John. Really only one that I can think of. The King's Road episode, episode two, where they, they split off. and Yeah, it's not even per se with him. It's also like that scene with Robert on the King's right. Road. Yes. Where, you know, he wants to kill Daenerys and he's talking about Rhaegar and you'd see kind of that like, ugh, tell me we're not talking about this. <laughs> Maybe they told him that Daenerys is really his brother, Brandon's daughter with... Oh, yeah. Maybe those members of the fandom... We're right the whole time. I just saw a YouTube video last week that once again brings up that John is the son of Ned and Ashara, and that's going to be the third twist. And people are going on there, well, like, well, even in the show, they didn't really, you know, break him and mistaken, and they didn't show anything that could be that big. It could be John. Yeah, except there's been no mention of fucking House Dane whatsoever, except for, like, Arthur. But they also showed the baby right to John's face. Like, yeah. isn't that, like... <laughs> How much more specific do you want them to be? This is the same guy now that all of a sudden has the new and approved plot leaks. Plot outlines. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, you texted me about this. Yeah. I guess spoilers or possible spoilers. Not likely, but possible spoilers. Spoilers. They'll have to be more. Spoilers. They'll have to be more. Released like six days in a, you know, in between episodes one and two. It's it's a podcast where he released not G- YouTube, oh, okay. YouTube, right. and you know he teased Golden Company plus Yorana going up to the north, and they're going to attack John and Danny as well as the, as the Night King. It's going to be a three on three eight battle, and basically he teases for all for episode three. All I could say is Jimmy Lannister nearly dies, and Yorana Greyjoy captures Jon Snow. Why? I wouldn't mind that actually being true, and I'll tell you why. It makes a lot more sense, because there are some plot leaks you know that John is in King's Landing. Yeah. One of the outlines has it that John tries to go down and talk Cersei into help them. Again. Right. 
But that doesn't make any sense why John would leave when he knows the battle is going to come. He wouldn't have leave the North. He wouldn't have abandoned the North. Especially after he already did all that and finally got back to the North. Right. He's not going to abandon the North knowing the Night King is there. That he's going past Carthold and, you know, where the Umbers are. He's not going to go back down south. And they're going to get word quickly that the wall has fallen. I mean, you can see the fucking thing from... You know I mean, it's, it's like the biggest man-made object in the north. Like, how, how are they not going to hear that the wall fell down? And he's not going to hear that the wall fell down because of an ice dragon. And be like, oh, man, I got to go I gotta go try and convince Cersei to help us. That he's going to stay and fight. Yeah. So it makes a lot more sense in my eyes for Magic to be captured by Euron Greyjoy. And then also why I would like that he gets captured in episode three. Do you really think in two more episodes, he's going to be set free? Yeah. Someone's going to set him free. Because there actually is, this also goes hand in hand, there is a rumored script leak where Jamie's talking with Cersei and basically saying, you have the one guy locked up that can defeat the Night King or help defeat the Night King, and you're locking him up. So if that is true, a bunch of ifs, it makes a lot more sense that someone's going to rescue John. Whether it be Jamie, whether it be Ari and Sandor. Remember, who knows how to get into the Black Cells without being noticed? Yeah, okay. Arya Stark, married back season one. Okay. When she heard Varys and... Uh, Illyrio Mopatis. Illyrio. Who's been right. conspicuously absent from uh, the final seasons. Yeah. She knows how to get down in there. It would make a lot more sense. If he's captured, he's set free. Do I really think he's set free, then all of a sudden, Illyrio going to die anyways? Who, John? Yeah. I don't think oh, so. Oh, I don't... Yeah, I don't think so either. This is in the plot leak? Well, I'm just saying, no, in general. Just in general, if he, is gonna, if, if he were to die, you want to get again captured, be set free, and then die again. Right, okay, yeah. There's another plot leak out there, or not plot leak, plot... Plot points? Plot points that three of the seven main characters die, and there's a fourth death that's a fake death, and they come back to life somehow. Three of the seven main characters, that includes Jamie Cersei, so that's one and two. Yeah. That yeah, I think those are two of the two of the two of the three right there. It's just imagine who's going to be that third one. Well, who are we considering the seven? I mean, Cersei, Jaime, Tyrion, John, Daenerys, Arya, Sansa. So Bran's not included. No. All right. So then, who would the third be? I'm going to say Danny. Yeah, I got to go Danny also. And the fake death, the fake death would be the Danny, or maybe somehow, some way, it's Sansa. Okay. Maybe they think she's dead, or she's not really dead, and she comes back to life. It'd be the worst moment of the series. God, kill her. <laughs> it would be like the print. It'd be like the Princess Leia moment in the last Jedi. Maybe you think she's dead. Oh, that's that's a pretty good parlay into something I didn't intend on talking about. But you've heard the episode nine news with Carrie Fisher's unused footage from The Force Awakens. <sighs> fan service, baby. That's that's what J.J. Abrams is all about with episode nine. Is the fan yeah. service. Well, at this point, he's got no. He probably has no other, no other retrap but to do fan service at this point. Yeah. Now, let me also ask you: Is it true that they're bringing Luke back alive? I don't think so. I didn't hear anything about that. That's what I heard. Uh, man, if that's true, that's just like JJ just trying to bring in damage control. I mean, we can definitely expect Luke to come back as a, a Vision or a Holly, you know, a yeah, right, right, Force right. goes right. But if he comes back like alive. Then you know it's just like, well, I can't read two episodes away, but I have to do something to get past me and Ryan Johnson's. <laughs> Episode nine opens with Ray waking up from a dream. Yeah. <laughs> on her way to see Luke. <laughs> it's, it's Star Wars episode nine. It gets crossed out. Hold on. It's actually episode eight. Episode nine is coming out next year. Okay. okay. The last Jedi never happened. I don't want to comment too much on the James Gunn situation, which I'm sure you heard about, but. The Guardians of the Galaxy, all the actors, signed an open letter to Disney, not saying hire him back, but saying, you know, we support him and he's a good guy. Some people have, uh, <laughs> I guess it was a beeb where they, they took all the signatures of the Guardians of the Galaxy and they took out the whole letter, though, that just wrote, The Last Jedi is a good movie, <laughs> signed the <laughs> Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> I don't know why that tickled me, but that made me laugh when I saw that. Yeah, Star Wars is a mess. Anyway. A couple more news items. Book of Swords is nominated for this year's World Fantasy Award in the anthology category. The Book of Swords, if you recall, edited by George R. R. Martin himself and the late George R. R. Martin alias. 
<laughs> Gardner Desvois. And also George contributed another one of his fake history stories, The Sons of the Dragon, which I know you haven't read. It is actually a good read. I really do. I hate myself for, for enjoying them so much, but I do really like these fake history Targaryen stories. And I'm sure that's going to win in the anthology category because what other fucking anthology book does anybody really care about? You still have no interest in reading The Sons of the Dragon or The Rogue Prince or The Princess and the Queen, The Blacks and the Greens, any of these short fake history stories that he's released since A World of Ice and Fire? I think I have The Princess and the Queen, if I'm not mistaken. I think I have that. Yeah, that was the one in, uh, I think Dangerous Women was the name of that anthology yeah, book. Yeah, also yeah, yeah. edited by George R. R. Martin and Gardner Desvois. No, it's my friend Gardner. <laughs> You never see us together, but that's... You guys take a picture together? <laughs> well, you know, he's very busy. He's very camera shy. He's writing a book called The uh, <laughs> the Scrolls of Winter. <laughs> <laughs> a really fast and prolific writer. Now, this is pretty cool news. Although, I know you're not that excited about Fire and Blood. As you know, Fire and Blood will be released in November. Unless I'm wrong. Is it released in October? I think November, right? Yeah, I think November, early November, Fire and Blood is being released, which is more fake history focused only on Targaryens. And Random House is trying to heat up that fandom fire for uh, new stories set in Westeros. They've released a Targaryen family tree poster, which is a pretty cool idea. And something I might consider getting for my office here is a, a Targaryen family poster. And I was taking a look at it. It looks, it looks pretty good, but there is some issue with it. These issues were pointed out by Elio. And these are basically... <laughs> Let me read the story first. I'll, I'll tell you what, what I think is going on here. Uh, Random House has made a poster available featuring the Targaryen family tree that will appear in Fire and Blood. They provided a sign-up link for their mailing list that leads to a PDF of the same poster. Fans have already started pouring over it, and we thought we'd comment on a couple of things that have been pointed out. So this is Ilio writing this. Mm -hmm. First, yes, Rhaenys not being connected to Aegon as a spouse is an error, and Aenys as their offspring, consequently. So apparently there's errors on this family tree based on shit that's already Ugh. been written. This is not some hint that George Martin has radically changed a fundamental aspect of Targaryen history. We admit we were one of quite a few eyes asked to look at this, and for our part, we were so focused on the minutia that this rather obvious issue totally passed us by. So Elio, who is normally George Martin's fact-check aficionado, he missed this plot hole. See, I wouldn't get that anyways. I would even if that was correct, and I'll tell you the reason why I wouldn't get that right now. Why am I going to get a family tree if I want to see all the Targaryens when we're not... Can I see anything from George confirming RLJ right. as part of the family tree? Right. It's worthless in my eyes. Yeah, I mean, as far as A Song of Ice and Fire, the story that he should have finished and the story that he should be working on, it's inconsequential to the events of A Song of Ice and Fire, which is the story that everybody's interested in. I'm just going to have to release another one 15 years from now. Well, here's the second part to this. Regarding the changes to the children of Jaehaerys I and Alysanne, it should go without saying that their history has seen the most substantial expansion as befitting a couple who rule so very long. So this was Jaehaerys the Conciliator, right? Or Jaehaerys the Great, the Old King, the guy, the, mm -hmm. the longest reigning Targaryen King. George had some new ideas for some of the names and the stories of the children who died young and corrected some issues that came out of his original birth order. We actually got the names of all the kids quite late in the production of The World of Ice and Fire, literally a month before we had to finalize the book, so there was not much time to reintegrate it. However, the stories of those who lived to adulthood, as published in The World of Ice and Fire, do remain the same, just much more detailed. We're seeing if The World of Ice and Fire can get its family tree updated accordingly in the next printing. So it's basically like George R. R. Martin should be writing The Winds of Winter. We don't think he is. We're getting to a point where... I can live the rest of my life without the winds of winter and not be surprised. And yet he's going back to the world of ice and fire and making changes to Targaryen history, which will have no effect whatsoever on the winds of winter. It's like he's retconning his own bullshit, which nobody fucking cares about anyway. It's like people got mad about George Lucas going back and changing the trilogy with the special editions. I mean, personally, I didn't, I didn't have a problem with it, but a lot of the fans that were older than us had a big problem with it. He's doing that, but like on a much smaller, more pointless scale. Like there's 
no point in changing any of this Targaryen history stuff, except to make more Targaryen history books interesting to George, who's writing them. So I don't know how I take this news. I mean, at first glance, it's like he's, it's like Martin is doing a lot of work on stuff that is meaningless and obviously taking away time from the winds of winter, but what else is new? I mean, he's, he's, he's essentially been doing that for quite a few years, but now it's like, instead of working on a TV show or editing a book with quote unquote Gardner Devois, he's going back on, on like expanded universe shit from the book he should be working on. And like, right. Like he's fixing that. It's like, dude, what are you, like, what are you doing? It makes me worried about the mental place that he's in. I'm worried about his mental health if this is what he's so focused on. And Elio, even though he's a Martin apologist or a Martin defender, will never say anything wrong about Martin or about how long it's taking for the Winds of Winter to come out. He'll never comment on being disappointed that HBO finishes a story that Martin should finish. I'm disappointed in Elio because who gives a fuck about future printings of the World of Ice Ice and Fire? Nobody gives a shit. Nobody is looking at the World of Ice and Fire that closely where we care about Kids that died young from Jahari's one and Alisane. Mm-hmm. I'm not angry though. I'm not disappointed. Nothing. I'm just honestly, uh, I'm, I'm worried about the mental health of George Martin at this point. And I am a little bit disappointed in Elio because he should know better than to entertain this. I do remember I was excited when the World of Ice and Fire came out. I was excited for that. Looking back, we probably should have been mad that that was a big release for him that year because. If not that year, the next year should have been the Winds of Winter. Anyway, uh, there was one more news item that I thought was interesting. Nothing on filming, right? Nothing's leaked. I mean, they're done filming. Yeah, the only thing, uh, the only thing I have extra is um, Sophie Turner said that the final season is going to be filled with betrayals. <laughs> Unlike the rest of the series. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, it's just a matter who betrays who. I mean, obviously, Euron's going to betray Cersei. Yeah. I think it's um, Cersei betrays Jamie or nah, well, Jamie betrays uh, Cersei? Does Sansa betray John? Wouldn't surprise me, but I don't think so. Wouldn't surprise me. And how should a character ever come back from that? I think it's just got to be either somehow either Tyrion betrays Danny or Cersei's going to betray Tyrion. Maybe Tyrion really believes that Cersei's going to help him. Yeah. I've said this before. I don't like the idea of a Tyrion heel turn. I don't think we'll get a full Sansa heel turn, even though a lot of her behavior is antagonistic. So betrayals. Yeah, I would think it has something to do with Cersei, Jamie, and, and Tyrion. I don't. I really don't think Tyrion is going to betray Jon or Daenerys. The only reason I don't say for sure is because of that final look that he gave them as they closed the door yeah. to have boat sex. I feel like that was more Tyrion, if anything, feeling like he's being replaced as her number two by Jon Snow or worried the ramifications of them betting together. Tyrion's the kind of guy that always is thinking a few steps ahead. But I I just, I can't see him betraying them. Like, for what? If for anything, the only thing believable would be for his family. So if Cersei can fool him into thinking she's siding with him, I still don't see him betraying Jon and Daenerys. When he says he believes in Daenerys, he legit believes in Daenerys. You know, that's not some bullshit he's throwing her way. Just like even with Sansa, if he does betray them, there's no turning back for him in the fans' eyes. Yeah. They'll hate him. He'll be hated. All right, so real quick, I know we've discussed this before here and there, but I don't think we've ever had like a definitive list. And not that we're going to make one right now, but the reunions that have not yet happened that should be real interesting to see. Bran and Jamie. Bran and Jamie, Sansa and Sandor Clegane, Arya and Sandor Clegane. How about Sansa and Tyrion? Sansa and Tyrion. Mm-hmm. Um, Sansa and Cersei. We got to see that again somehow, right? Uh, b- 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 maybe, um, maybe not logistically. Possible at the very end, maybe. Jamie and John. Jamie and John and Nikolai Costa Wilder was bringing that up a couple of times in interviews. We met this one time in. Season one, but now it's like, I'm going up north, so I'll probably have some interactions, hopefully, with him. So, as I've been saying for a long time, Jamie Lannister will do something to help Jon Snow. Absolutely agree with you. He might not do something to help out Bran to make up for it, but he'll do something to help out Jon. Well, maybe he he intends to help Bran, and then he gets a good look at him, and he's like, oh, this guy is not... Oh, God. This guy's... Oh, boy. 
Oh boy, um, this guy. All right, that already draws the biggest one. Okay, when it says that's the biggest one. Yeah. Along the lines of John and Arya, do you think that I think not so much Kit Harrington, but do you think that Macy Williams is a talented enough actress at this point in time to really convey? the emotional punch that that scene should carry. I think Kit Harrington is because you had the John Sansa reunion, which did carry an emotional punch. Of all the Stark kids... They were the farthest from being close. Oh my God. Well, like, yeah, like, give a shit if they ever saw each other again. But it still carried an emotional punch. So Arya and John, the one we're looking forward to the most, I think he could pull that off if he could pull off the weight it had seeing Sansa again. But Macy Williams, is she really a good actress? Or is it just she's had this credibility as a badass from when she was a little kid in season one that's just carried her? Right. Well, what, what I was going to say is the Macy Williams from seasons one and two could probably pull off awesomely. But if she could be so enamored with this warrior type right. character, if she could be able to strike back that, that soft side. In my eyes, you know, this is going to be high expectations for me on this, mm-hmm. on this reunion. Like if. Sansa and Sandor, are like, all right, it's cool, expected. I'm not going to look forward to it. What I look forward to is John and Arya. Right. Well, I mean, I, I look forward to all of them. Honestly, dude, I, I probably, there's probably a few that I look forward to more than John and Arya, but that one should carry the most emotional weight and should have the most focus is the John and Arya reunion. But John and Jamie, even Sansa and Tyrion, uh, I, I would look forward to more than John and Arya. And I think it's because of my lack of confidence in Macy Williams acting. I'm not saying she's a bad actor, but I don't know that she's necessarily a good actor because if you think about her storyline, she's gotten by based on a really cool character for a little kid and a pretty cool adventure the rest of the way. Like, you know, the people she's traveled with have always been cool characters. Sandra Clegane, fucking what's his face before we got too deep into the house of black and white, uh, What's that guy's name? Gendry. Well, Gendry and Arya, that's another reunion you're looking forward to. Sort of. Yeah, yeah. Jock and Hagar. He was a real cool character in season two. And when she first found him again in season six, he was kind of cool. But it got less and less cool as that went on, I thought. We don't have a list yet of who's directing what episode, right? Oh, no, we do. Episode one. Yeah, yeah. All right. Oh, cool. I don't know if I saw this yet. Yeah, so... Uh, we talked about it. Right? Episode 1, directed by David Nutter, written by Dave Hill. Episode 2, Dave Nutter, written by Cogman. The last four, written by Benioff and Weiss. Episode 3, directed by Sapochnik. Episode 4... Battle of Winterfell. Yeah, probably. Well, he's doing episode 3 and episode 5, and then Nutter is doing episode 4 again. So Nutter's doing... Wow, not just doing three episodes, and Benioff and Weiss were only doing one. I thought they were doing two. I thought everybody was doing two. That's interesting. The reason that I'm bringing this up is I'm trying to fit in when we would get a Jon Snow, Arya Stark. Episode two. So if it's episode two, that's, I mean, it's still a David Nutter episode. And as much as I love Miguel Sapochnik, he's more of an action guy, but I don't, the way that sounds, like he's like Michael Bay, but he's not like Michael Bay. Like there's heart to his action, there's emotion. To the action. It's not just a bunch of robots transforming. You know what I mean? It's not just violence versus mm-hmm. violence sake. There's weight to the violence. But like quieter moments, the emotional impact of dialogue and a scene between Jon Snow and Arya Stark that we want to see. I, f- I-, I feel like Nutter is better uh, suited for that. But if it's episode two, that's a, that's a Cogman wrote that. So I guess that's okay. One reunion we forgot to talk about. One reunion? Mm-hmm. Davos and uh, Melisandre? Nope. Hold on, hold on. Let me see if I can guess. Uh, not Sam and John, right? Well, them too. Yeah, but that's not the, that's not the one you mean. Um, no. Oh. Grey Worm and... Uh, fucking... <laughs> nope. Nope. Uh, I don't know. I'll give you a hint. One of the characters that are probably going to bring back just to kill him off. Uh, oh, you talking about Clegane Bowl? Nope. Uh, I can't believe you can't get this. Bringing back a character just to kill him off? 
Uh, Technically, he is a he. Might not be a man, but he is a he. Varies? God. Oh, duh. How am I missing this? Theon. No. Oh, my God. Jon Snow and Ghost. Oh, duh. <laughs> Bro, I don't think we're going to see that. I don't think we'll see Jon Snow. No, no. It's, it's, it's I think we'll gonna see happen. Ghost ever again. No, yeah, we have to. You're right. You're right. We have to. And we probably got to see Nymeria again, too, right? You would think at the end. Dude, you're like, technically, he's a he, so I started thinking about... Like, <laughs> technically, he's a he. He might not be a man, but he's a he. Like, oh, Theon, all right. <laughs> Although, which Theon... Does Theon have any reunions left in him? Wait, he's guys, John Stone? he's going to have to save... Uh, His sister, but... Yeah. I guess Theon seeing Bran, but I don't know. Bran's just not Bran anymore. Are you excited yet, or too soon? I'm more nervous more than anything else. What's going to happen? You're nervous if Jon Snow's going to die. Yeah, I'm going to know if he's going to die. Or or maybe even worse, not die, but pass up being king. Would that be worse? Because think about it. If he dies, then we got to hear it from Silk for ever. Yeah, how he said, I called that. I called it. I called right. It. Like, the, like the worst case scenario is Jon Snow dies and Daenerys is queen. End of show. Never will we ever hear the end of that. Euron is just basically dragon bait in episode one or two. Well, for 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 us to say with Brian, if Danny lives and comes queen and John dies, then yes, that would be the worst case scenario. For me, the worst case scenario is Sansa coming queen. Worst case as far as like when you're alone at night, you feel the dark creeping in and you know that Sansa's queen of the Seven Kingdoms and Jon Snow. He died, was brought back, died again. No explanation. You got anything else as far as news or anything going on in the world of Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire? No, that's it. Well, thanks for listening. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Promise Princes. Follow us on Twitter at Princes Promise. You can actually now, I don't know if I told you this, John, you can now find The Princes That Were Promised on Spotify. And apparently, a lot of people listen to podcasts through Spotify. And not only that, it's difficult to get your podcast onto Spotify. We got on because our host, Podcast, shout out to podcast.com. They just started a relationship with Spotify. We're on Spotify. It's still kind of hazy as far as if there's like a Princess That Were Promised page on Spotify. I'm not really too sure how Spotify works because I have Apple Music. I don't use Spotify, but we're on there. So you can find us on Spotify, SoundCloud, not SoundCloud, whatever the fuck that thing is, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, Stitcher. We're all over the place. Find us, subscribe to us, leave a review, tell a friend. We are the princes that were promised, and we will speak with you guys later.